bringing you a steady stream of thought-provoking ideas and cutting-edge innovation. You're listening to Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Welcome to Society and the State. This is episode 134. Connor here alongside Brian. On our last episode, you'll remember we talked about the social safety net and how that applies or doesn't apply, frankly, to uh, the modern welfare system. And at the end of that episode, we, we said, you know, we got to talk more about this. This is a complex issue. So we're very excited to have today's guest, uh, Michael Tanner. He is senior fellow with the Cato Institute, has a brand new book out called The Inclusive Economy, How to Bring Wealth to America's Poor. It's got some exciting stuff in it that we're uh, eager to unpack. Michael, thanks for joining us today. Well, it's a real pleasure to be with you. So maybe let's uh, start with a high-level question, uh, Michael. You've been working on uh, issues dealing with social welfare and poverty for a while with the Cato Institute, and you've written some other books. So why write this book in particular? What drove you to kind of uh, write a, a fresh perspective on it? Well, I think that my earlier books had dealt primarily with the welfare system and the failures of the welfare system, the programs we currently have. But I didn't feel like that that was proactive enough. It's easy to cast stones and say what's wrong with what we're doing now, the money we're spending, and the results we're getting. But I wanted to look at actually how we can get poor people out of poverty. What can we do to actually lift people out of poverty rather than just focus on how the government is failing now? And and let me, before we dive into some of your analysis in the book, uh, I, w- I wonder if we can get your quick commentary on what Brian and I were talking about our recent episode, and that's this. Uh, there's this perception, I think, that the modern welfare system is the social safety net that pretty much everyone agrees that is helpful and beneficial. We want to care for those in need and so forth. But when you look at the term itself, you know, social safety net, right, the, the modern welfare uh, state is not social. It's, it doesn't bring together the giver and the recipient there's no self-reliance aspect. There's no accountability. And then I don't know that it's a, a safety net per se. I was thinking this morning, Brian, after we recorded that episode, the analogy more that like, yeah, you're in a net and maybe it cushions your fall, but then you get tangled in the net, right? You're getting stuck in there. There's no escape. There's no escape. There's dependency. Michael, what are your thoughts on that about, you know, there's there's widespread agreement that we need a social safety net, but in a lot of people's minds, that's just a justification for the modern welfare state um, in your mind, are the two related? Do we need to disconnect them? Or what are your thoughts there? Well, a lot of it depends on what the goal of that safety net is. If you look at sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you have that pyramid. And at the very bottom of it are the basic necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter, and so on. Our safety net actually does a pretty good job of providing that. Uh, there are the sort of material poverty that existed even as recently as the 1960s really doesn't exist today. That, that There's very few people starving in America. Most everybody has a roof over their head. Uh, those That type of poverty we've done a pretty good job of doing away with. And yet it would be difficult to walk through uh, Sandtown in Baltimore or East Fresno or Owsley, Kentucky, the poorest community in America, and say that people in those communities are thriving, that they are flourishing, that they are the masters of their fate, able to rise as far as their talents will take them. They're not getting up towards the top of that pyramid, self-actualization. In that sense, we have failed those people. I have a question as far as um, historically. I know that there are there are different explanations given for poverty, uh, particularly by politicians who may stand to you know gain uh, constituency by how they answer. But in your estimation, um, what's the best explanation you have seen for for why poverty exists in the first place? Well, I think there's a variety of causes of poverty. And I I think that we need to look at both the suggestions on the right, which largely has to do with the poor decision making by the poor themselves. Uh, The conservatives often point to something called the success sequence. And there's no doubt that there's a statistical correlation here. That says basically, if you finish high school, uh, better even go on to college, if you then get a job, and if you finally, if you wait to have children until after you're married, you are unlikely to be poor. Fewer than 3% of people who follow that sequence actually end up living in poverty. I think conservatives are right to point to that. 
Uh, and liberals, on the other hand, tend to point to larger societal questions, the continued existence and the historical legacy of racism in our society, mm-hmm. gender-based discrimination, the economic dislocation that comes from the creative destruction of capitalism, uh, that those often can, can push people into poverty themselves. I think there's truth to both of those uh, arguments, if, if you will. I think you can't just strip poor people of agency and pretend they're chaff blown by the winds of fate, that their decisions have no impact on their lives. That's a very demeaning uh, way to look at the poor. But neither can you ignore the fact that our decisions and choices are often constrained by the social situations in which we live. That if you're a poor minority child in the inner city where there's few jobs, where the school system, public school system is terrible, where you're hassled by the police every time you step foot outside your door, you're going to end up making a very different set of decisions than if you're a rich, rich white kid in the uh, suburbs. Yeah, I think that's a compelling point. What what I found uh, very interesting about uh, your book was that there's a lot of analysis out there about poverty. It's it's historical characteristics, which you get into talking about different cultures and and uh, different t- periods throughout history, uh, talking about how it how prevalent it was and it was accepted as kind of the natural condition and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of analysis out there about kind of the history. There's a lot of prescriptions, right, for how we solve it and how we tinker with the welfare state and how we can kind of um, hack the, the the leaves and the branches, if you will. What I found interesting is, is, from my perspective, the meat of your book seems to be focused on policy reform areas that people don't traditionally think about when they are talking about helping the poor. And that's what I'm excited to unpack a little bit with you today. I want to start maybe with criminal justice reform. Um, You talk a lot about that in the book and how it relates to poverty. Maybe give us a quick synopsis here for our listeners of why you think that there's an option, a potential to help uh, improve poverty rates and conditions through criminal justice reform. Sure. Well, if you have a criminal record, it makes you very hard for you to become a full participant in the economy. Uh, That if once you if you make a mistake when you're 20 years old and you get a felony conviction, when you're 40, you're still having to check that box saying you have a felony conviction every time you apply for a job. It makes you much less likely to get hired. At the same time, it can make you uh, ineligible for scholar- college scholarships, and financial aid, or even to get into some schools. It can actually make it harder for you to get housing. Landlords can ask you whether or not you have that felony conviction. So in a variety of ways, uh, our criminal justice system can tag you forever. Uh, once you've made a mistake early in your in your life, and that that can move you outside uh, the mainstream of economic life, and that has consequences all the way down the the road. One of the things conservatives have long worried about is fatherlessness, especially in the inner city. They point out that the rate of birth outside of marriage has skyrocketed in recent years, and that often can be a root into poverty. You're five times more likely to be poor if you have a child when you're not married than if you wait until you're married. But the question that one should also ask is exactly who are these poor women supposed to marry? Uh, It's not like there's this giant pool of computer programmers waiting around to to scoop them (laughs) up. Right. Uh, You know, you can look at the work that, and I quote in my book from William Julius Wilson at Harvard, who points out that you have a million and a half young black men who have essentially been stripped out of the marriage pool because they have criminal records making them unemployable uh, and, frankly, just not good marriage fodder. How does expungement play into this? There's kind of a renewed conversation around the country in the criminal justice reform realm, especially lately with this. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this clean slate initiative yeah. uh, we'll be talking about on a future episode. The, and that is uh, basically alleviating the ability for people who have you know, paid their supposed debt to society. They've served their time. They haven't uh, reoffended. You know, they qualify for expungement to begin to automate the process and alleviate, basically just get it off their records so they can uh, go basically, as you say, get a job. What are your thoughts as expungement uh, uh, in the criminal justice context relates to helping the poor? Yeah, I think that would be a big help. Uh, Certainly at some point, people should be uh, able to start over with a fresh slate, and that would be a, a big step in the right direction. But we should look at what gets them into trouble in the first place. We have a vastly overcriminalized society. We put more people in jail than I believe any uh, country in the world except the Maldives on a per capita basis. Uh, we, you know, we lock people up for a lot of things that shouldn't be crimes. Let us remember that uh, up in New York City, Eric Garner was actually killed for the crime 
of selling an untaxed cigarette. Mm-hmm. That's all too typical of our criminal justice system. Yeah, well, well put. Now, you mentioned that there, there are multiple areas where, where government actually can do harm um, in terms of, of the poor. Let's talk about education. Well, we know our government school system lets down uh, people across the board, and particularly poor people uh, and people in minority communities. Uh, there's no surer way to get out of poverty than to get a good education. Uh, and yet our government school system doesn't provide that for far too many people. You could look at cities like Washington, D.C. or Baltimore or Chicago or Los Angeles. These are cities that spend an enormous amount on every child on a per, ca- per student basis. And yet the education results are terrible. We have a school system that largely exists today for the benefit of the teachers unions and the administrators, not for parents and children. And we really need to turn that around. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You look at uh, parents around the country and then you say, hey, look at somewhere like Washington, D.C., where they're spending double, triple the amount uh, that your local school district or state is on education spending. That's a lot of money per pupil. That's a lot of money for the teachers. And you couldn't pay those teachers to to put their kids in those schools, right? Tell me also, uh, what are your thoughts about the the geographic restrictions that a lot of schools have, right? You basically go to your neighborhood school, you're assigned there. How does that play into people in lower income communities effectively consigned to the fate of whatever uh, teachers, whatever uh, educational services that are provided in their local school? Well, that's right. It's actually a crime in some uh, some jurisdictions. Uh, in New Jersey, it's punishable by five years in prison if you actually send your child to a school district that you're not assigned to. Uh, there, there's actually people in New Jersey serving prison time because they used uh, one woman used her sister's address outside the district in order to send her kid to a better school. I mean, we basically ghettoize poor children and push them into schools that can't provide for their educational needs. And then we wonder why they're too quick to drop out or they're not getting uh, jobs or not being trained for jobs when they get uh, educated. Uh, the, the school, money shouldn't be about school systems or school districts. It should be about children. Hmm. That's, that's interesting. So um, another chapter you have uh, talks about an issue that has really erupted in the past few years. We went through the supposed you know, recession a decade ago and the housing boom and bust. And, and here we are back again that, that across the country, in certain pockets especially, uh, housing prices have really accelerated far beyond anywhere they were a decade ago. We seem to not have collectively learned uh, the mistakes of the, uh, the past so as not to repeat them. Here we are again, high housing costs. Why is, uh, why is that policy reform area essential to uh, poverty and low-income people? You talk about deregulation and the importance of you know, high-density housing. Uh, we have NIMBY issues coming into play. Talk to us, kind of broadly speaking, about how the issue of housing affects poverty. Yeah, I was surprised to see just how important housing was as an issue when it came to poverty. Uh, the poor spend a disproportionate amount of their income on housing, about 40% on average for housing or rent. Uh, which is a large chunk if you don't have a great deal of money. But even more than that, the inability to afford better housing or or rents in better neighborhoods sort of locks the poor into poor communities. Uh, They can't send, you know, they can't move to an area that might have more jobs or better school system, as we were just talking about, or uh, lower crime rates. They're basically trapped where they are. And a lot of that cost of rent actually has to do with government regulations, zoning laws and land use laws in particular. Uh, In some cities like Manhattan and San Francisco, zoning laws alone add 50 percent to the cost of housing in those neighborhoods. And those are largely uh, laws that exist to protect the aesthetic values or the property values of existing uh, tenants and, and owners at the expense of the poor. They are basically segregationist tools. That's really interesting to think of it that way. So it's basically protectionism, not for a specific business or industry, but for the upper class. Well, that's right. Uh, you know, I mean, there was a, actually an article in the New York Times a couple of months ago about people who had $2 million apartments in New York City and were upset because there was high density housing going in across the street that was going to ruin their view of the river. Uh, you know, I'm sorry. That's just not something I feel a whole lot of sorry for them about. Yeah, that's interesting. Michael, let's talk a little bit about the mindset of consumption versus savings. Uh, you point out that there are a lot of government policies that actually discourage savings. And, and isn't that one of the key ways to, to get out of poverty? 
this should be common sense. You don't spend your way out of poverty. You actually get it by saving money so that you can invest it in things that will get you out of poverty, like job, uh, you know, starting a business or sending your kids to school. But on both sides of the equation, we tend to punish savings and encourage consumption. We make it very hard for the poor to simply open a bank account, for example. We're so obsessed with the war on terror and the war on drugs that we've adapted all sorts of identification requirements to open a bank account. About 20 percent of poor people lack the proper identification to simply open a savings account. That means that they are driven to sort of non-bank alternatives that have very high fees, check cashing services, things like that. It also means they're forced to walk around with large sums of money in their pocket, which can get you robbed or picked up by the police thinking you're a drug courier. At the same time, our welfare programs encourage you to spend every penny you have uh, so that you can qualify, but they punish you if you save any money. If you get your welfare check and you go out and buy that new pair of Nikes, hey, we're cool with that. But if you put some of that money in a 527 account for your kid's education, we're going to take away your check. Uh, If you have a car so that you can get a job to get off of welfare, we're going to take away your check. That seems to me to be very wrongheaded. Why do you suppose, Michael, as we wrap things up here, like it seems to me an innovative approach to the issue of of poverty uh, reform and addressing some of the solutions to talk about things that are not so directly connected to simply – modifying or improving the welfare system. You're talking about policy issues that most people do not connect. In your experiences, you've written and talked around the country about this. Do you see that same disconnection and how can we try and resolve it? Well, I think we get locked into debates in Washington that just kind of replay over and over again. It's the the poverty funding debate, part 26. So we spend $98 billion a year on food stamps. The left comes in and says, no, it really should be 99. The right says, "Low, well, let's cut it back to 97. And we pretend that that's going to make any real difference. Uh, we really do need to look at other solutions to this uh, before we start having the same old fights in Washington. And as I've gone around the country and talked about my book, I have seen a willingness on both left and right to sort of open their eyes to to new ideas. This is stuff I think that can get broad bipartisan support, maybe not in this political atmosphere where we're so divided, but I I do think at the grassroots level, people are are paying attention. Well, we certainly hope they do. Uh, Michael Tanner, your book uh, can be found on Amazon for listeners who are interested, The Inclusive Economy, How to Bring Wealth to America's Poor. We will also link to it on our show notes page for today, societyandthestate.com slash 134. Michael Tanner is Senior Fellow at Cato Institute. Michael, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Anytime. Thanks for listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com. 